There you go. Perfect. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Kay, recovered alcoholic. And this is the third step prayer, which is on page 63 of your big book. I hope everybody's got your big book, a pen, a piece of paper, and a highlighter. If you have any questions, we'll take them at the end of the meeting. So the third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, and I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. I do thy will always. All right, Rob, thank you very much. We are actually in Bill's story, and we are near the top is where we're going to start today uh, for uh, uh, on page four, uh, page four of uh, Bill's story. And we're going to start with the paragraph uh, that starts abruptly. Page four, everybody. Abruptly in October 1929, I broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was eight o'clock, five hours after the market closed. The ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of the tape which bore the inscription, XYZ minus 32. It had been 52 that morning. I was finished and so were many friends. The papers reported men jumping to death from the towers of high finance. That disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock. So what? Tomorrow was another day. As I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. That's yeah, real quick here. One of the things that I think is important is that um, Bill doesn't really, um, he's not really affected, if you will, like the others were with regard to the uh, crash of the stock market. And, and, and he um, uh, is more interested in drinking than he is in his own uh, well-being and his, his wealth, whether he had it now or not. And in fact, in this case, he has no, nothing. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight as far as this paragraph is concerned is the uh, capitalization of high finance, um, further indication that at this point in time in Bill's life, he hadn't found a higher power other than the fact that he was holding dear um, uh, his money as being his higher power. And, and I think that that's, you know, obviously that'll change in the future here, but right now uh, it's interesting to see that. I'd also offer up that the other thing that uh, Bill is holding near and dear to his heart is alcohol. So I would say that um, he would probably have had to, he put that in here, he would have capitalized uh, alcohol as well. Um, but those are the things that are going on at this point. We're actually at the um, um, stock market crash and the further development of Bill's uh, addiction to alcohol and his alcoholism as it's uh, continuing to uh, control his life going forward. Rob? Yeah, for those that love history, the XYZ minus 32 was, the stock was Pennington Ford, for those who like that type of information. Uh, also, one thing I wanna point out to people is that the papers reported men jumping to death from the towers of high finance. That disgusted me. I would not jump. In a couple of pages, we're going to find out that Bill's changes his uh, tune quite drastically. And so, as we see, Bill's story is a progression of alcoholism. And uh, please note how deep Bill goes into it. And, and right now, Bill's solution to everything, back to the bar. You know, everything can be solved with a few drinks, right? We forget about uh, how life is going and how it's treating us. Next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left and thought I'd better go to Canada. By the following spring, we were living our custom style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me, but drinking caught up with me again and my generous friend had to let me go. This time we stayed broke. Okay, so the, this keeping in, uh, in, in the theme that uh, Rob was talking about earlier, he said he telephoned a friend. This particular friend is Dick Johnson is his name. And the company that uh, Bill was going to work for, which was Dick Johnson's company, was Green Shield and Company. In addition to that, we're talking about the Christmas of 1929 is when he actually went up to Canada to start working for uh, Mr. Johnson. 
And um, it was in the spring of 1930 uh, that they actually um, um, were uh, all built up, had money again, and were uh, living like they used to be. And when his generous friend had to let him go, uh, essentially he, he was fired. Uh, again, just because of the fact that he was allowing alcohol to control everything about him. Rob? Yeah. Beautifully put together, Leo. You took my storm with the Dick Johnson, so <laughs> keep going. We went to live with my parents, wife's parents. I found a job, then lost it as a result of a brawl with a taxi driver. Mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work in a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. Yep, and... Um... This this is uh, an interesting thing with regard to his uh, finding a job and then lost it as a result of a brawl. I think he was on his way to his first day of work, so he never actually even started uh, officially with the uh, with this particular company that he had found a job with. Um, in addition to that, his his wife began to work. So at this point, the, the in in trying to bring any income whatsoever into the family, it fell to uh, her. And she began to work at a department store, which we uh, have come to know as Macy's. Uh, and so that's where she was working. And uh, again, she would come home and um, uh, at least some of the money that she was making and that they had, um, Bill was buying alcohol and, uh, and drinking and becoming drunk. So if you can imagine the scenario or the scene of coming home and having a husband that's drunk, I'm sure that uh, a number of us can uh, can relate to the fact that uh, we were uh, that person uh, for other loved ones in our family. Rob? For five years, he didn't work and hardly drew a silver breath. Can you imagine how Lois must have felt? Working day after day, retail, helping other people. If you've ever worked retail, it is exhausting sometimes dealing with the public, you know, their demands, et cetera. And you come home exhausted and your husband is drunk. It's a tough life. We're on page five for everybody. I became an unwelcome hanger on at brokerage places. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day and often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars, and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. This went on endlessly, and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. A tumbler full of gin, followed by half a dozen bottles of beer, would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation, and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Yeah, so there's... There's a lot here. First of all, this is one of the uh, passages that we come back to on a regular basis. And this is something that is uh, important for all of us at that point in time in that transition through uh, uh, our phases of alcoholism. Uh, we are now at a point when Bill's uh, um, uh, scenario here, his life where li liquor ceased to be a luxury. Uh, it became a necessity. He has no choice in drinking now. He is at that point where the malady is, is raging and he uh, has no defense against that first drink. And once he starts drinking, he's get the allergy is kicking in. And um, I would tell you that, uh, or I would surmise that really the allergy has just taken over and he's just continuing to drink. Um, and, 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 um, and that's just also uh, has, has control over him. But this is a progression of alcoholism. It's that point in time where we actually start to um, think about it from the time we wake up in the morning. Uh, I certainly can attest to the fact that I would plan for uh, out, I'd plan out my day and it was all surrounding as to when I was going to be able to start drinking in that day, whether that be a weekday where it would be as early in the afternoon as I possibly could do it. If, if not on a weekend, I would figure out a way to probably start drinking sometime in the mid to late morning, if not uh, early afternoon for sure. Um, but this is at that point where um, it's no longer a luxury and it's now a necessity. I think another thing that's interesting here is that when he got any money at all, 
the first thing he did was go and pay the bars and delicatessens and that basically to support his habit. So I think it's, you know, if you really unpack this a little bit, you know, it's, it's, I'm not taking care of utilities, I'm not taking care of food, um, any kind of rent or, or assistance I might be giving uh, Lois's uh, parents at their house, but I'm going to go and actually pay the bars and delicatessens first so that I can continue uh, my habit. Um, and then nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. And there were periods of sobriety. And this is what we kind of have come to know is that white knuckling uh, kind of uh, scenario where you basically have stopped drinking for, let's say, one one day to a week of, uh, at a time and thinking that somehow because you've been able to control it for a day or a week or whatever, that you now have some control over your drinking, which you really don't. And this is where you are using your own self-will to fix um, uh, self with self. And, um, and, and obviously, each time, uh, Lois would basically uh, have some hope that maybe this is the point in time that uh, Bill would actually stop drinking and stay stopped, but all to find out that that is just not going to happen. Um, he just doesn't have the inner strength that's necessary in order to be able to um, to stop drinking. And again, at this point, he has not found a, an adequate higher power in order to do so. Rob? Yeah, you know, uh, well put, Leo. You know, the great obsession of every alcoholic is that they, they will one day be able to control and enjoy their drinking. Uh, I still thought I, I could control the situation. How How long did I think? that to myself you know I, I kept trying and trying and trying and I failed each time but on page 23 and 30 they talk about the the, the obsession which is that you know I'm going to one day be able to control and enjoy it but when I tried to control my drinking I didn't enjoy it and when I was I was enjoying my drinking I couldn't control it you know the allergy would take over and boom I was off to the races but let's re keep reading gradually things got worse the house was taken over by the mortgage portfolio. My mother-in-law died. My wife and father-in-law became ill. Then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point in the, of 1932, and I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious, prodigious bender, and that chance vanished. Sure did. This... Um things getting worse, they are just going to get worse. And that at that point where uh, liquor has ceased to be a luxury and you're now drinking as a necessity, it's now controlling Bill. And I would just basically say that with the exception of his times of being passed out, blacked out or asleep, he is, 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 uh, is, is drunk or inebriated. Um, and he does you know, scrape up a little bit of opportunity here where he is essentially trying to put together a business opportunity. Um, he, he does go on this uh, prodigious, which is another word for a big bender. And, uh, and uh, he actually gets drunk, as we have now come to know, is a, a, a substance called Applejack, which is a, a New Jersey moonshine uh, in uh, um, in this, uh, this prodigious bender that he went on, we actually know is, uh, he went on at three days straight of drinking. So, um, he goes out, finds this Applejack or this New Jersey moonshine and, uh, goes on a three day, uh, bender and everything vanishes at that point. Um, again, as things continue to get worse and worse. Rob? Yeah, please remember, everybody, that prohibition was going on in the States from January 1920 to December 1933. This is 1932, so we're still talking prohibition is taking place. You know, uh, the paragraph before, they talked about bathtub gin. And liquor was made in, in people's bathtubs. Sometimes you didn't know what you were getting. You know, white lightning in a bottle. You know, could some people went blind from drinking some of this crap. You know, so they, you know, you were if you didn't know what you were getting you were taking your life in your own hands so please don't don't forget about prohibition i woke up this had to be stopped i saw i could not take so much as one drink i was through forever but then i'd written lots of sweet promises but my wife happily observed that this time i meant business and so i did 
Yeah, and this is really the point in time where he finally recognizes that he's got a problem and that he's actually powerless over over alcohol. And um, he was uh, um, looking at it as that he thought he was uh, through forever, that there was just no way he was going to be able to ever overcome uh, his alcoholism and his drinking. And as he was writing these uh, sweet promises, we, we have come to know that he was using the family Bible and putting in uh, notes in there, basically saying that I swear on the family Bible that I am going to stop drinking. And um, uh, again, his willpower is not is not what we have come to know at this point as being anywhere near uh, sufficient uh, in order to stop drinking. And um, at this point, we've got the point where he actually relapses again and again and again, to the point that I would just say that he's not really relapsing. He's just basically white knuckling through one to three or one to few days um, of, of non-drinking, but then followed up with drinking again. Um, and and the, uh, um, the frustration and the anger and the... Um, the uh, absolute uh, futility that he is experiencing uh, with his, his drinking. Rob? It says here, I saw I could not take so much as one drink. So let's go to page XXIX for one moment. XXIX. Yeah. And it's the third line down. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develop, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree emerging remorseful and with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over again. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic chain, there's very little hope of his recovery. So you take the first drink, the allergy kicks in, the phenomenon of craving, we just want more. The body just craves more. As our friend Bill from New Jersey always says, our brain wants its candy and it will tell us anything to, to get it. So. We just keep drinking more and more. The allergy takes it over. You know, there were so many times I had great plans, but I would take that first drink and all those plans would disappear. Why? Because I wanted another drink and another drink until it got to the point where I couldn't go out. It wasn't safe for me to drive or to walk, you know? And so then we isolate and we end up staying in our own little cocoon. We're frothy emotional appeal where my wife is going, don't you think you've had enough? You really need another one, you know? But you know what? My body craved it. My mind wanted it. And there was nothing that was gonna stop me at that time. Shortly afterward, I came home drunk. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had drank my way and I'd taken it. Was I crazy? I began to wonder. For such an appalling lack of perspective, see near being just that. Yeah, he really doesn't want to drink at this point. Uh, that's becoming more and more clear. Uh, so I know that we're at that point where he's drinking so much that he's finally tired of it and um, and is and is trying his darndest to uh, to stop. But he's baffled. He's baffled uh, a couple of times in here. I didn't, I, I simply didn't know. And in, in, in regards to this relapse, he just wasn't aware of what was going on. He has, doesn't understand alcoholism at this point. And when he asks himself if he was crazy, you know, there's where the insanity is setting in and, um, and it's just getting worse and worse. And if you can remember and those times when you were at this basic stage or phase in your, in your alcohol. I think Leo froze. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had something really important to say too. I know it. Yeah. Hang on. It's going to just hang with me. Is everybody there now? Yeah, we're here. Okay. Sorry about that. So what I was saying is, is was I crazy? And it's a, uh, this obviously is the insanity is set in. And I guess we, we're at the point in time where we were at, where we are essentially looking at ourselves as I can't stop drinking. I don't, I, I, I want to stop drinking. I'm finally, I've had enough. I've seen the consequences. The consequences are mounting and there's just layer upon layer of destruction and frustration and, and anger uh, not just with myself, but also with family and friends. And uh, it's just time to stop. Yeah. But again, not understanding alcoholism and being baffled by it. 
Rob? Yeah, before this, it was always the consequences that got Bill's attention. Now we realize it's the first drink that's causing all of this. You know, so we're going to be talk, start talking about the malady, the malady that happens in the mind where we can't, we have no control over taking that first drink. You know, it, it, before we know it, drink is in his hand, he's taking it. Now, his sanity is in question. You know, before we thought that uh, self knowledge, fear would sober us up, we could stay away from the drink. All these things haven't been able to keep Bill away from his, the drink. Renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed and confidence began to be, be replaced by cocksureness. I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time, I was beating on the bar, asking myself how it happened. As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I would manage better next time. But I might as well get good and drunk then. And I did. Yeah, so really this overconfidence, he basically has gotten to the point where he's going to get a few days under his belt and be able to stop drinking. He thinks that he's got control of it, and he really doesn't. Um, but because of that, he actually uses that to kind of uh, pump himself up. And, and I knew uh, I've been there in the past where I could get a week or two under my belt, and I thought to myself, I've got this lick. I was ignoring all of the the pangs, the 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 urges, and the um, the the, the uh, lack of of understanding, and uh, obviously the first chance I got, because my mind was churning in the background trying to figure out how I was going to get to and take that next drink, even though. Um, I was saying to myself, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. And sure enough, I would start to drink. And the next thing I would be saying is, is, well, I'm going to do better next time. I got two weeks this time, maybe next time I can get three weeks, but in, in, but in the interim, I'm going to get good and drunk. And I can actually attest to this with no regard whatsoever. And I, I, I would find alcohol because I was a, I was a person that hid alcohol in my house. Um, and, and really it was in my garage. That's where I hid my alcohol. And uh, when I would find it, instead of doing what I was, had resolved to do, which was to get it and announce it and pour it out, get rid of it, you know, et cetera. I would sit there and look at it for a short period of time. The next thing I'd know, I would be drinking without even thinking twice about it and then wondering what the heck had just happened. Um, so, Rob? Where had been your high resolve, Leo? Oh, it was <laughs> not to be found. No, unfortunately not. The remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street, lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that. So two bottles and oblivion. Yep. He is at this hopeless stage at this point in time. He is now hopeless. He's having uh, mild to moderate panic attacks in the morning where his brain is racing uncontrollably and there is a terrible sense of impending calamity. And certainly there was. He's shaking and looking for some way to relieve um, the anxiety that he's feeling with regard to uh, to trying to find alcohol and then find himself out there going to a place that's open uh, 24 hours a day. Um, and it would this would happen over and over and over again. And, and here we are again, you know, the market had uh, uh, gone, uh, gone to hell, he says. And the next thing you know, he is uh, not concerned with that other than the fact that now he's got to figure out how to get his next drink, and he certainly does. And he's basically drinking uh, to escape. Um, it's not, it's, uh, and he's drinking to oblivion at this point. Um, and uh, this is no fun for him whatsoever. He is in a very, very dark place in his life. Um, and I'm going to say this, uh, this is this is really at a, at a tough time for, let's say, as a sponsor, um, if you know somebody that's struggling mightily uh, with regard to drink, 
Uh, this is a hard place to try and get this person. It's, 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 you, it, it, they're on the verge. They're about to walk through that door, uh, but they have got to find themselves where they are uh, at least m marginally sober uh, before you can start working with them. But it's a, certainly at that point in time where somebody has hit uh, their, their bottom and they're kind of uh, uh, walking around at, at that point and, and, and being frustrated with it. So I just throw this out as a sponsor. Um, if you know somebody uh, or somebody that's uh, that needs the help, uh, you know, lightly uh, suggesting or nudging that uh, you may have a solution for them is uh, is certainly a good thing to try and, and do at this point. Rob? Yeah, if you'll notice on this page, should I kill myself? No, not now. Remember on page four, and he talked about uh, people jumping from high the towers and killing themselves, and that disgusted him. Why? It's only taken two pages for him to change his thinking. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms. Their mind endured this agony for two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakness. There were flights from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. Then came the night when the physical and mental torture was so hellish, I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor, lest I suddenly leapt. A doctor came with a heavy, a heavy sedative. Next day, found me drinking both gin and sedative. This combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. So did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. Yeah, so this is really truly where he is hitting his, his bottom. A couple of things here, you know, he has got thoughts of suicide on a regular basis. He is uh, stealing money from his wife's purse, which is obviously money that's uh, certainly meant for other things. So other things are starting to take a backseat more so than they were before. And again, uh, we talk about the suicide. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or a medicine cabinet where there was poison. You know, um, they were trying to get him to uh, sleep it off, and these sedatives that he got just added to um, his his demise. Um, and he had things are certainly unmanageable at this point, and they actually trying to get from city to country and back. Uh, this is a time when they would go to Vermont and try and have uh, Bill dry out uh, for a period of time. And, um, and it just didn't take at this point in time. Um, he is now uh, definitely at uh, his bottom where he's 40 pounds underweight. Um, it's interesting, I think, because he's not eating is part of that, but you know, the, the hollow calories that are in alcohol and everything can actually replace that. And uh, certainly um, had read a little bit about uh, uh, good health and, and nutrition. Obviously, he is not doing any of that. So being 40 pounds underweight, uh, if you've seen Bill, uh, you know that he's a relatively slender man in the first place. Um, so he could have been, I mean, uh, I'm sure he, he looked very gaunt, um, uh, to say the least. Rob? Yeah, you know, a combination of alcohol and sedative. Makes a lot of people go crazy, and uh, it's not a good thing. We're on page seven, everybody. My brother-in-law is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I'd been seriously ill, bodily and mentally. Yep. So, so here's what's going on. His brother-in-law, his name is Leonard Strong. So Dr. Strong uh, does as uh, um, gets him placed into a nationally known hospital for the mental and physically uh, physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. We're now talking about Towns Hospital. This is the first time that Bill is actually going to rehab, uh, which is an important thing here. Um, and the year is 1933. Um, he, uh, um, is given uh, both uh, physical and medical uh, 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 um, therapies. And, and, and at that point, he finally gets his brain to clear a little bit. 
and uh, he um, starts to realize uh, what what is going on with him as far as uh, his his mind and his body, the allergy and the malady, which we are going to find out later as being the absolute two symptoms of of alcoholism. Rob, yeah, you froze up there for a second, Leo, near the end of your. Oh, okay. I was just saying at the end here, the bodily and mentally uh, uh, part of this is now we're looking at the uh, the allergy and the malady, which are the two symptoms of alcoholism, and um, and he's starting now to uh, to learn and find out about that. Okay. It relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fare forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. Yep, and, and here's a point in time where he's really starting to learn a little bit about uh, himself and about alcoholism. Um, this is where that self-knowledge starts to kind of creep in and take control. And um, just a little bit of self-knowledge, as we all have learned, uh, doesn't go, uh, go very far. Um, this, this passage at the very beginning, when he talks about amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though often it remains strong in other respects, we're talking about where you are making good, sound decisions in other parts of your life. And, and let's, let's just relate to what some people call as a high-functioning alcoholic, somebody that is able to get up in the morning and, and go uh, and, and work for uh, the better part, if not the full day. Uh, they are uh, seemingly okay. Their, their uh, demeanor seems to be uh, uh, acceptable or, or uh, even upbeat. But there's this dark cloud, this, this big skeleton in the closet that this person has. And they basically are finding themselves uh, drinking uh, behind the scenes. And um, he is uh, thinking now for the first three or four months, this, this first time around gives him the ability to kind of put three or four months under his belt. When the goose hung high, things were going good for him. Um, and he was actually thinking that he had probably been able to, to, to get over this. But now we know this self-knowledge that uh, he's got, which is that self-will, uh, it always fails. And uh, as we're going to see, he's going to relapse in, as far as that goes. Rob? But it was not. The fright It's more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was to finish. The curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or to the asylum. Yeah. So this is the second time that Bill goes to Towns Hospital. It's the year is 1934. He is in, in really bad shape as they basically say, say that uh, it would all end with heart failure uh, during his delirium tremens. And, and, and I think it's an important point here to make, and that is, is that uh, the DTs, the delirium tremens, as we uh, have come to know it, um, are it's very serious. Uh, this is actually one of the uh, the worst withdrawals that you can go through with regard to substance abuse. And I just want to make sure that the statistically about 15% of people that go through uh, detoxification, this, this delirium tremens period of time actually die uh, from it. So it's very, very important that you uh, uh, look at uh, medical uh, uh, under, a, under a medical care or at least uh, somebody that's going to observe you and keep you uh, safe while you're going through this um, is, is also very important. So I want to put that out there. The wet brain uh, is uh, um, known as the Warnicke Korsakoff syndrome. It's something akin to Alzheimer's um, as far as that goes, but um, that what is the official uh, or medical term for wet brain is the Warnicke Korsakoff syndrome. Rob? Yeah, say that over again a few times. Hey, that, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Yep. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my ability, of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. 
Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There would be much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. Yeah, this is um, um, the, uh, the it, I, I like to call this a particular pa uh, paragraph. It's really the get, the gift of desperation. Uh, at this point, um, um, Bill is desperate. Uh, he is uh, thinking of his poor wife. He's uh, in, and and there is uh, um, happiness that he that used to be there, and what he wouldn't give to uh, to get back to there. Um, sots, S O T S, is just another word for uh, drunks in in the way that he is using it here. Um, but it is a very very dark period of time for him, and um, and he's basically. Um, thinking to himself that there's just futility that he has done and down for the count. Rob? No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Now, and really, the important thing here is that words can tell how lonely is the, the loneliness and despair. He is very, very much alone at this point. And uh, and I would just say that let's just call this at his very, his bottom is really at, at, at his feet. Um, alcohol was my master. At this point in time, this is the first place where we would actually say that Bill is admitting his step one. He is totally un, uh, out of control with, with alcohol and it is, um, it is completely in control of him. Rob? Yeah, Bill knows that he has a problem, but he has no solution. And without a solution, what do we do? We continue doing the same cycle that we've always done. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. And on Armistice Day, 1934, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I could call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness peace and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Yeah, this is basically, he goes out um, on Armistice Day, uh, which we now have uh, come to know as Veterans Day. Um, he, um, um, he gets that first drink. He had not planned on drinking, so the malady kicks in once again. Uh, and he goes on to a one month uh, uh, debauch of drinking. Uh, at that point, and we do get this kind of uh, uh, glimpse into his future. He was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in, in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful at as time passes. So we actually know that, that at this point that Bill's going to make it, um, but the, 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 the news still is, is that he has still got to go through a process to get there, but at least we know that this is going to be uh, turn out good for him as it does turn out good for us. Rob? Yeah. Okay. Uh, don't forget that in Canada, it is known as Remembrance Day. Just like to throw that in. Yep. Uh, near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. Yeah, so just as a real quick here, um, the hiding of alcohol, uh, that is in the latter stages of a lot of alcoholics. We relate to that. Um, the stories I've heard, as well as the stories I've told you about my hiding it in the garage, um, I used to find, uh, I would rinse out, uh, of all things, Gatorade bottles, and I would fill them with alcohol and, um, and set them about in uh, behind things and that type of thing in the garage. And it, and it really was that I would try and drink like normal people in front of people, which would be those two or three drinks that I would look like I'm drinking as uh, and, and trying to keep it under control. But there would always be a reason for me to go to the garage and then I would go out there and drink uh, something out of a Gatorade bottle and then come back in and I was still drinking that one glass of wine or the, you know, et cetera. 
Um, but that's the way I would go. Um, I was never worried about my second or third drink. I was always concerned with getting my fourth drink and how I was going to do that in front of other people. And it became this, um, I, uh, uh, this game. And, and, and uh, I thought I was doing it and uh, being very good at doing this and being secretive. But uh, nonetheless, I do have found out later that uh, people knew what I was doing, uh, which just is a pathetic uh, way to live and um, in a situation that uh, I, I came to be embarrassed about and um, completely defeated when it, when it was happening. But I just share that with you in that uh, this, is a, this is a common scenario for people at the latter stages of their drinking is to hide their alcohol in uh, different places so that one, if somebody comes in and says, well, I've got this bottle, I'm going to pour it out, and you're not going to get anything, you know, I would know that I would have alcohol hidden someplace so that uh, that person couldn't get all of my alcohol and, uh, and pour it out. Rob? Yeah. Yeah. Uh I just want to go back to Armistice Day for a second. And Bill, I hope you, you will tell the story about uh, what happened on that day with Bill, uh, about where he was going and what he was doing, uh, because it really will hit home. But he wasn't thinking about drinking. So my musing was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. Rumor had it that he had been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wonder how he had escaped. Of course, we would, he would have dinner, and then I could drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in a dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. Yeah, this is something that uh, we, we kind of hang on to and cling to, um, and that is, is to find another alcoholic or another heavy drinker to drink with. Um, misery loves company, but drinkers love drinkers. And so uh, in this case, we're talking about Ebby Thatcher, uh, who became a close friend of uh, or was a close friend of Bill's, and they had plenty of escapades and stories in the past of some of the things that they did uh, with regard to uh, going out and, and drinking. Uh, but I'll put it this way too, is that he only cares about his own drink, drinking. He says, I'm unmindful of his welfare. I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. And that is really basically what he's trying to do is find a reason to drink, which he really doesn't care about the other person. He just wants to have a scenario to say, hey, this guy's coming for dinner. We're going to drink like old times and all will be good. Rob? The door opened and he stood there, fresh skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. It was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what had got into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come, what's all this about, I query. He looked straight at me, simply, but smilingly, he said, I've got religion. Yeah, so Ebby, here's the, here's the scenario. Ebby has come over for dinner. Uh, the door is opened. He's all fresh skinned and glowing. Uh, he's in a good mood. Uh, he's got about two months of sobriety at this point. I think that they said roughly 72 days if we got it pretty much as far as that goes. Yep. Um, and uh, he has gotten sober via the Oxford group. So that's another uh, thing that we'll learn more about as we go along. But here's here's the deal. I pushed a drink across the table. Uh, he refused it and disappointed. He's he's now kind of starting to realize that this isn't going to be what he thought it was going to be, where it's going to be two drinking buddies getting together and going through and getting drunk together. Um, he is now on his own. But uh, at the same time, as we'll find out, it's just that he's going to have more alcohol for himself. And, and again, he's thinking really only of himself although his curiosity is up. And uh, at this point, at least he's willing to listen. So we've got, we've got um, Bill at a point where he's probably semi sober here and he's, and he's alert and he's willing to hear and listen to things. Uh, but at the same time, he's still drinking. Rob? Yeah, Bill always said that if he ever got as bad at drinking as Ebby, he would quit. <laughs> well, Ebby's already quit. Ebby, uh, pulled some stunts. Uh, if anybody is interested in knowing about one of the stunts that he pulled, uh, put your email in the chat and I will send you a little uh, 
article that uh, mentions uh, one of the escapades of Ebby, uh, because he is quite the character when it comes to to our readings. But he did no ranting. In a matter of fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court, persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was two months ago, and the real result was self-evident. It worked. Yep. We uh, we did miss one of the paragraphs there, Rob. Oh, did I? I? I was aghast. So that was it. Last summer, an alcohol crackpot. Now I suspected a little crack about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. So we've got a situation here where, you know, uh, you know, one, uh, Ebby is 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 basically sharing his uh, his his uh, experience and now his strength and hope with with Bill. So this is really the first time that we see this. Second thing is, is that uh, Bill is is curious. He's interested. He's even got a little bit of a sense of humor here um, with regard to uh, to Ebby. And at the same time, just like we said before, he's not he's 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 actually relieved because he's going to have more alcohol to drink for himself. And uh, and and essentially, he's now at least listening. Rob, but he did no ranting in a matter of fact way. He told how two men had appeared in court, persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was two months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. Yep, and 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 this is this story, and I think that that's a part of what uh, Rob will share. Uh, Ebby had essentially uh, have driven uh, into a person's uh, uh, fence and house, and uh, when he got out, he was asking for a cup of coffee. Um, he was on his way to jail uh, at this point, and uh, a couple of folks from the Oxford group who were looking for uh, people like Ebby to, to help had come to his aid at in court and essentially had said, give him over to us and, uh, and we will work with him, and, uh, and they took uh, control of him. So uh, this was uh, Siebert Graves and Shep Cornell. And, uh, and Siebert Graves was the fa uh, father, uh, was the judge. Uh, I'm sure, was Roland Hazard a part of this as well, Rob? He was part of it, but uh, they think that he was at uh, Evie's house oh, waiting okay. for them. Okay. All right. And if you have anything to add to that, Rob? No, but that's basically it. You know, it's funny how circumstances warrant is that, that, that you know, Siebert Graves' father was a judge. So if it was just a right, some other judge, they might not have let Ebby go because this is Ebby's third time, basically. Uh, and, you know, they've about had it with his escapades, you know, but here, you know, the judge was kind enough to uh, let him go to these people at the Oxford group, you know, and uh, thank God they did because, uh, you know, Ebby carried this message to Bill and thank God he carried it to Bill. And thank God I got the message. So he had come to pass his experience along to me, if I cared to have it. I was shocked, but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. He talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sunday, way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good natured contempt of some church folk and their doings, his insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen, his fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died, these recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. Yeah. Um, what's what's happening is is Zebi is is basically talking about uh, a little bit about religion. He's talking about how he has become sober because of it, and uh, he is uh, basically sharing it with uh, um, uh, Bill. And as, as again, it says, it's a, he had come to pass his experience along to me. So we're still doing that experience, strength, and hope. And it's if I cared to have it, um, it is being laid at Bill's feet. Uh, this is the beginning of his uh, learning of having to find a higher power. Um, 
we'll go on and I'll go ahead and finish this last sentence here with, the, with regard to this part of it. Now, the wartime day in old Win Winchester Cathedral came back again. Um, you know, this is a big thing for, for Bill. And if you remember back at the beginning of Bill's story, uh, part of what he uh, had was he was in England. He visited Winchester Cathedral. This is back on page one. Um, and uh, much moved, I wandered, uh, uh, wandered outside and his attention was ca uh, caught by a dogger, doggerel uh, on an old tombstone. And uh, uh, here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier is never forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. And uh, we have learned that that small beer is a low alcohol content beer that this person has uh, died. And uh, the, um, um, that's, that's all part of his experience and things are starting to come back to him uh, from his uh, past. Uh, he obviously has had a resistance to religious uh, uh, doings and that's part of what he's also uh, talking about here. Rob? Yeah. Uh, do you want to bring Bill into it now? Yep, or... absolutely. Hey, Bill. Hey, hi, this is Bill, alcoholic from New Jersey. I was having a little trouble getting muted, and I'm muted here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot, Leo and Rob. Good job here. Uh, Bill's story is like really, really important thing here. And what they're trying to show us here, or what Bill's trying to show us, he's trying to show us the progression of alcoholism. How we started out drinking a little bit all the time, you know, or having fun and games, and it got worse and worse and worse. And then he got to the point where he was ready to kill himself over it. So it, it, it progresses, it gets worse. His uh, consequences kept getting more and more. They were getting worse and worse. And you know, he was losing jobs over it. He went to Canada. He lost the job over his drinking. He came back and he tried to get a job uh, somewhere. He found work uh, somewhere in New York and he got in a brawl with a taxi driver and he lost the job because of that. So he, he's getting more and more consequences. He got to the point where he can't even work anymore. All he's doing is sitting home and getting drunk and it's getting worse and worse. He's at the point he's drinking for oblivion. So he's not drinking to have fun. He's not having a good time. There's no more block parties, no more barbecues. He's just drinking and passing out on the couch or the floor or wherever he is. And that's, that's what he's trying to show us here, how alcoholism gets worse and worse and worse. It doesn't stay the same and it doesn't go away. And he talked in here, uh, Rob asked about this here, uh, Armistice Day thing. What happened right after Bill came out of the hospital, he or so with him for a bit. He was going to stay sober out of fear of what, of what he learned what was happening to him. And he decided he was going to go play golf on Armistice Day. So he went to Staten Island. They have a, uh, a public golf course on Staten Island. And he had to take a bus to get there. So he got on a bus with his golf clubs, and he ran into a guy on a bus that had a rifle. This guy was going to a shooting range that was on uh, Staten Island. So... Bill is the type of guy, he starts talking to you, and right away he makes friends with you. He starts talking to this guy, oh boy, that's a really nice rifle. I know all about rifles. I grew up on a farm, and we had shooting irons and all that kind of stuff. And now all of a sudden, these two guys are buddy buddies. And as they're on their way going to Staten Island, the bus had some sort of an accident. It either hit the bus in front of it or the bus behind it hit that bus. Or, and the policy of the bus company is when there's some kind of an accident, Everybody has to get off the bus and they send a replacement bus there. So they're all waiting for the bus, for the new bus to show up. And this guy says uh, to Bill, hey, look, there's a place to have a drink right here where we got off the bus. Let's go in and have a drink. And Bill explains to him he can't drink, you know, uh, but I'll go in and I'll have a ginger ale with you. If I drink any alcohol, I'll go nuts. I'll wind up in the hospital or the asylum or the undertaker or I'll go through the DTs. So, okay, so they go in. Bill has a ginger ale. This guy has a drink. They come back out. They get on the bus and they go to Staten Island. And when they get there, one of them decides that, you know, it's 12 o'clock now. We should have been here maybe an hour or two earlier. Now it's lunchtime. Let's have lunch before we leave. So they walked into a, some sort of an inn or a bar and grill that was right there where they got off the bus. And Bill wasn't going to drink. He had no intention of drinking. 
And when they walked in the door, the bartender saw them coming, and he put two drinks up on the bar, and he said, here you go, boys, have one on the house. It's Armistice Day. And Bill, without even thinking, those strange mental blind spots, whatever you want to call it, the insanity, he just reached over, grabbed the drink, and downed it. And it, and this guy said to him, after the story you told me, you must be crazy. And Bill said, you know, you're right. I am crazy. So the point of that story, they're trying to show us, even when we don't want to drink, we have no intention to drink. If we're going to drink, we know we're going to get in trouble. So we're never, ever, ever going to do it again. And out of the clear blue sky, bam, just like that, we pick up a drink without even thinking about it. That's why we need this program. We need to have a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening so that stuff doesn't happen to us. And again, this story is a, it's basically a testimonial on what happened to Bill in his life. And the first part of it is his drinking life. And then we'll get into the next part of it uh, of how he recovers and how he has his spiritual awakening. All right. Thanks a lot for letting me share. Thanks very much, Bill. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, Bill. I could have told that story, but it wouldn't be anywhere close to how well Bill tells it. So <laughs> that, that, that's why I was hesitating there for so, so much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's go ahead and close things out and then we'll open it up for some. some okay. Discussion. The serenity prayer, everybody. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. <laughs>